Yo, so guys, welcome back to another video. This is a reaction to the animated history of Mexico, and this was suggested in my last one of my last posts that I've done. I was actually looking to do like a Mexico sort of food reaction, but I didn't really know what the best video was. There was like a top ten which involved, I think it was like Watch Mojo, but I just don't think that's sort of like the best best channel to watch when it comes to like a Mexican food. So maybe suggest under this video if you're interested in that sort of a Mexican food type video because again I know Mexico one of the things it's known for is it's incredible food but yeah that's for another time but yeah the animated history of Mexico it's going to be an interesting one we're going to learn about like how sort of Mexico became the country it is today and I don't know what you're going to get into it really let's just check this out quick shout out to my Instagram my Twitter links in the description for those interested same for my Patreon links in the description for those interested in that there's a lot of Patreon exclusive videos at the moment so yeah, links are all there for everyone who cares for that. But let's get into this. It's a long one, but I'm excited to get into it. You seem to be digging, digging the um, Mexico reactions, and I love doing it as well. But yeah, hopefully we can do some more. Again, suggest some videos you want to see in future, and let's just get into it. The Samurai Limited Edition pin is oh, yeah, available yeah, is now. Hurry and order yours now before they run out. Or get one for free by signing up at Patreon like all of these nice people. This episode is supported by Curiosity Stream. Sign up today and get access to Nebula, a streaming platform money. for creators by creators. Mystery. Love that is the it. word you'd use most often when studying ancient pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Not because we don't know what happened, but more because we don't know why it stopped happening. The oldest American writing system, the Mayan script, is suspiciously quiet about events leading up to the fall of great civilizations. Is this because of ignorance or neglect? Or, more morbidly, because dire circumstances prevented records from even being made in the first place? We just don't know. Mystery. If you were going to start a civilization on the American continent, southern Mexico would not be a bad place to start. Mesoamerica was a warmer and more temperate congregation point for the continent's new migrants, Paleo-Indians, arriving over the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia. To build a civilization, you need four things people, a stable climate, access to water, and a staple food crop. These secret ingredients were bountiful in the south. Lush rivers, domesticated maize plants, only the occasional drought, and soon enough, the Olmecs. With access to some of America's most virulent crops, three important cities emerged on three river systems. Civilization was born. Along with it came culture and trade. It's a lot easier to pass down knowledge if you all live in one place. The Olmecs are considered the mother civilization of all Central America for good reason, spreading their way further outward while trading with every other pre-Columbian civilization that would follow. Mysteriously, the Olmecs eventually faded from their prominence, perhaps due to their rivers silting up. But the hard work was already done, and knowledge had spread all the way down those trade routes. Oh wow. Oh, that's just a fucking intro. God damn, that's crazy, bro. I'm, I can tell I'm already going to enjoy this. I find it so wild how, like, civilizations were initially formed and, like, how the people who first formed them were, like, when you were just going down the land, you must have thought, like, the land would have just went on forever. Obviously, it didn't. But again, those days must have been wild for the people exploring the world for the first time, finding all these different spots that now have become countries. I find the sort of history behind it so, like, it's just it's incredible, really, when you think about it. It really is. It is not surprising to see the various civilizations that sprang up on those old trade routes. The Maya who had existed for centuries in the Guatemalan highlands had descended into Yucatan for trade and had learned a thing or two about this whole new civilization thing. But what made them particularly successful was their abundant access to limestone, which is not only great for building cities that can endure all manner of erosion and earthquakes, but also great for filtering clean drinking water in underground caves. The first major power in the region, Kaminali Juyu, rose up to prominence for its control of the obsidian trade. From there, the Maya would spread further into the Petén Basin and then into Yucatan, building from limestone as they went. And then, all of a sudden, nothing. Abandoned cities, defunct trade networks, and derelict monuments. The mysterious pre-classical Mayan collapse. Archaeologists have been scratching their heads about what led to this downfall. Was it war? Was it famine? We just don't know. There's nothing written about it. 
nothing we have records of anyway, and even less in the way of archaeological findings, which only gets more confusing with what comes after. The classical Mayan period is probably the one you're most familiar with. Most of their scientific achievements comes from this era, including the Long Count Calendar, which caused a bit of a stir back in 2012 for its supposed prediction of the end of the world. But oh, there's no evidence that the Maya ever God actually, damn. you know, thought this. But imagine the world actually ended in 2012 and it was because the Mayans found this thing thousands of years before. God damn. Or hundreds of years before. This was both the most prosperous period and the one we know most about, with cities and monuments recording dates and events using them. No, thousands of years before. BC, I don't, I forget, what one are we in now? BC's... Isn't it before Christ? What's after Their that? calendars. Forget, forget. Science and engineering feats advancing their understanding of the natural world. Power returned in the form of powerful city-states, not much unlike classical Greece or modern... Monaco, I guess? City-states are a lot rarer these days. But anyway, as you may expect, having a whole bunch of cities in one area competing for resources is kind of a recipe for disaster in the long run, and these Mayan ones were no exception. A great example of this was the war between its two most powerful cities, Tikal and Kalakmul, a conflict which has its origins in the invasion and subsequent installation of a new dynasty in Tikal by the great city of Teotihuacan. Wait, 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 who the heck are these guys? Ah, uh, welcome to yet another one of Mesoamerica's great mysteries. Teotihuacan was an absolutely massive city all the way over here in the Valley of Mexico. Its people, as well as who built it, is unfortunately lost to time, but at its peak, for about five centuries, it ruled the trade between the vibrant civilizations of the south and the nomads of the north. And with such power and grandiosity, they were often meddling in the affairs of cities all over Central America. Their hostile takeover of the throne of Tikal would so destabilize the geopolitics of the region that the aforementioned war would dominate the later part of the classic Maya life for three centuries. And then, Almost out of nowhere, again, nothing. Cities abandoned and trade ceasing, similar to the situation that happened before. The classical mine collapse is one of the greatest mysteries of the historical and archaeological world. Political and mercantile power simply vanished without any obvious historical culprit. The Theories range as to what caused this, the constant warring probably didn't help, but equally perplexing is that even Teotihuacan itself had collapsed earlier, with evidence of riots and looting against the ruling class. Did whatever caused the great city's inhabitants to rise up against their rulers also eventually lead to the classical mine collapse? Who knows? What we do know is that the post-classic period would never rise up to the Maya's former glory, and would remain as a warlike, infighting civilization until its own collapse at the hands of the Spanish. But now let's return to central Mexico for a moment. What became of the ruins of Teotihuacan? Well, as you'd imagine, these guys left one pretty big power vacuum, and with such a prosperous area, it wasn't long before one of their more militarized subjects, the Toltecs, filled the void. But more of a conquering type than a ruling type, it is really their descendant civilizations that become important. The Aztecs. The Aztecs. Yes. See, the Aztecs for me are the most sort of, not memorable ones, but they're the ones I feel like I remember actually learning about. Them and the Mayans, but the Aztecs are definitely the ones that I'm the most familiar Aztecs with. Aztecs actually came comparatively late to the pre-Columbian game, considering how powerful they were, but how they actually started was an alliance of three former Toltec cities, the most important of which was Tenochtitlan. And it is here we finally get a great founding myth with a unique Mexican flavor. The story goes that the Mexicas people built their city on an island after they had a prophecy of an eagle with a snake landing on a cactus there. <laughs> Not deterred with the prospect of drowning, the Mexicas built an explosively massive city. Not only easy to defend, but also to supply with food and water from the lake that surrounded it. The so-called oh, wow. Triple Alliance between Tenochtitlan and its neighbors would form what we now know as the Aztec Empire, which is quickly able to conquer much of the former Toltec lands. And yes, they are also known for their extensive practice of human sacrifice. Oh, Ugh. geez. Because the idea was that the gods blessed them when given human blood. Kind of hard to argue that when you're the most powerful empire on the continent at the time. And one way they captured slaves for human sacrifice was through ritual warfare, the so-called flower wars. The Aztecs have earned their place firmly within the Mexican national consciousness, thanks in large part to them being the last great formidable empire in North America when the Spanish arrived. 
Now I've used the term pre-Columbian a lot during this video, and that's not because the famous sailor Christopher Columbus ever actually went to Mexico, but rather refers to an event called the Columbian Exchange. The Eastern Hemisphere's discovery of this new world which would eventually become known as America was massively important to history. Hard to overstate, really. The period was the largest cultural, religious and economic exchange the world has ever known. Fundamentally and irrevocably changing the trajectory of both the old world and the new. Concurrent to this exchange was conquest. If you are going to pick a European nation to discover and then begin the conquest of Central America with the least amount of chaos, you probably wouldn't want to have picked 16th century Spain. They were, after all, at the end of the Reconquista, a centuries-long process of expelling Muslims, Jews, practitioners of paganism and witchcraft from Iberia, backed by the Catholic Church. At the same time, they were increasingly hungry to gain wealth previously controlled by the Muslims, and they had just discovered a previously unknown landmass to the west, so it seemed like the perfect place to start. Driven by tales of golden cities and swathes of people to convert to Christianity, early colonizers of Central America were conquerors, so-called conquistadors, such as the famous Hernan Cortes. Cleverly allying himself with various cities that the Aztecs had conquered, Cortes destroyed Tenochtitlan, and upon its ruins would build a new city. Oh, wow. Mexico, meaning place of the Mexicas. The Viceroyalty of New Spain would be the new power in the region. Merchants, the conquistadors, explorers and pirates soon arrived in the thousands. So Mexico City was because of the, um, what's the word again? The people who traveled from Europe, they na like made a new city and named it that. I didn't realize it'd be like that though. That's kind of insane. Because it's Mexico City, I just assumed Mexico, people from Mexico, or like, they would have just made that their city themselves. But obviously it was like one of those things that, um, I can't think of the word, um, not explorers. What are they called again? The people who traveled from Europe, I can't think of the word that I'm looking to for. To this new colony, many enslaving the natives in a system called the Encomienda. Wow. Along with them came missionaries and religious zealots with the goal of converting the heathens from what they perceived to be their barbaric pagan religion burning their historical and scientific writings, fearing them as being works of the devil. The Spanish conquests were a particularly devastating period for Mexico. The Maya, for example, were weak and disunited and should have been easy pickings, but they took decades to conquer. Fighting in dense jungle in guerrilla warfare, ambushing the Spanish and laying complicated booby traps, forever fueling the idea that the new world was a barbaric and uncivilized place. The real war, however, was not against the Spanish, but against diseases. Measles, influenza, typhoid, yellow fever, and especially smallpox. Amerindian peoples of the New World had no exposure to these diseases before the Colombian exchange. Yeah. Combining these epidemics with asymmetric warfare against the more advanced weaponry and technology of the Europeans, modern estimates vary on the death rate of these conquests, some ranging as high as 90%. To the north were the Chichimeca, a confederation of nomadic Indians who were so powerful that the Spanish fought the longest and most expensive war of their entire colonial venture trying to subjugate them, being defeated time and time again before eventually resorting to diplomacy. But why were the Spanish willing to compromise? Silver. Many of the most prominent conquistadors were motivated by wealth, and when the Aztec gold turned out to be not quite as bountiful as expected, explorers went in search of minerals elsewhere, and they found the jackpot in Zacatas. Silver flooded the market from this mine, making colonizers and the Spanish rich beyond measure. New Spain's silver production was rivaled only by Peru, and so bountiful that the inflation rate would not only flood the international market, but also bring about the temporary economic collapse of both New Spain and even China. How's oh, that wow. for a weird achievement? What the Besides fuck? silver and cash crops, the Spanish main, as it was known, also dealt in other less savory trade, slaves. Although relatively few African slaves ended up in Mexico itself, <laughs> the wealth created by those silver mines has a lot to do with the demand increase for these West African captives. And so the transatlantic slave trade was born. Like elsewhere in Latin America, New Spain enforced a strict caste system which defined a social hierarchy on racial grounds, with Spaniards at the top, followed by Spaniards born in New Spain, then mixed race, and finally, the lowest of them all, Native American Indians. Let's... Bruh. 
Native American Indians in all of these, in all of the uh, all of the American the Americas, like um, from the USA to Mexico, and I guess other countries as well, they were just treated like. I mean, I know they were treated badly, but it seems to be like everywhere they were just treated the worst of the worst, and it's just fucking They're like this discrimination they must have faced back then. I can't even imagine, man. Fucking hell, man. You got off. You gotta just say, you just can't really put into words how devastating it must have been and how just shit it must have been for them. Not mince words here. This was a way of controlling people, making it harder for the disenfranchised to succeed in society and also keeping their elites loyal and happy. It is in this strange new geopolitical landscape that the defining characteristics formed of what it meant to be Mexican or what it eventually meant anyway, and perhaps nothing was more important than the identity of being Catholic. Catholicism was already immensely important to the Spaniards, but to make it a truly Mexican religion, it would need to appeal to everyone else. And so it would be by the miraculous apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe, perhaps no greater symbol of Mexico's devout. The image which appeared to an Aztec named Juan Diego was interpreted as a Christian incarnation of the goddess Tanatzin, and to the Spaniards as a native incarnation of the Virgin Mary. As a mestizo, she was half Spaniard, half native, and so the lady would forever symbolize the unity of these two races, and the faith would spread throughout the land, blending Christian beliefs with American ones, forming a truly unique flavor of Christianity even blending long-practiced traditions of venerating the dead with Hallowtide to form what would become known as Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead. Oh, wow. In fact, cultural blending in essence is what makes Mexico what it is today. Everything from food, music, the aforementioned religion, alcohol, and even its people is a blend of Spanish and Amerindian influences. Today, Mexico is the largest mixed race nation in the world, with more than 80% of its citizens belonging to the mestizo classification. Although life was already hard in New Spain due to the economic collapse, it was the new Spanish monarchy, the Bourbons, reforming the colony that really made life more difficult. The Bourbon reforms aimed to boost the production and exports in the new world and to make the colony more economically dependent on Spain itself. And in a time when mestizos and criollos were the vast majority of the population, it's not hard to see that the elite peninsulares were the only ones who really benefited from this. The growing discontent was also taking place during the Enlightenment, when all sorts of power dynamics were being scrutinized. So it makes sense that revolution was soon on the doorstep. All it needed was a catalyst, which would come, confusingly, in the form of the French. When Napoleon invaded Spain, he basically threw centuries of political establishment out the window, putting his brother on the throne and making all manner of a mess in Spain's colonies who really didn't know how to react. When instability arrives in long established power dynamics, that is usually when revolutions happen, and with New Spain, it is no different. Peninsularis just wanted the old Bourbon king back, the Criollos just wanted to get rid of the Peninsularis, and the Mestizos just wanted to get rid of both the Peninsularis and the Criollos because they couldn't really tell the difference anyway. Soon the whole nation was up in arms with competing aims that changed over time, but toward the end of the uprising it was all gun ho for independence. Getting all the factions to agree what they were fighting for was the real challenge however, and would only be duct taped together in a compromise called the Three Guarantees. Mexico would be founded on the principles of unity, independence from Spain, and Catholicism. The war lasted 11 years, fought not only with Napoleonic Spain, but also the restored Bourbons. The new nation would be named after their Aztec ancestors, upon which they had built their capital city. But the Aztecs never called themselves Aztecs, but rather Mexicas, and their land was Mexico. But oh, history wow. tends to call this era the first Mexican Empire because, bro, I did not, I did not even imagine the history would be anything like this. There's so much behind it, and there's so much more to go as well. And I'm guessing there's so much more that could have been explained. But god damn, I was, I was not expecting this at all. There's just so much behind the country and like all these different like races and like cultures and what coming together. Like, just it's crazy, man. I was not thinking anything like this would be the case. But. One, it had an emperor, and two, it ruled much of what we call Central America as well. And putting it diplomatically, the empire came to an end after just two years, mostly because factions who supported one of the three guarantees always just kind of felt that they didn't much care for the other two beyond, you know, winning a war. And so the whole thing kind of just fell apart because oh, wow. nation building is hard. 
So hard, in fact, that the next century is what you would call a very messy time. If mystery is a great word for pre-Columbian Mexico, then instability would be the word for post-independence. Split into two factions, the liberals and the conservatives constantly overthrowing one another. Central America politely opted out in 1823. Texas impolitely opted out in 1835. Oh, when man. the Second Mexican Republic came to power, they wanted Texas back. Which was a bit hard for them to do when the United States annexed it in 1845. Mexico would fight a devastating war with the US, losing not only Texas, but nearly half of their territory in the process. Which, as you can imagine, didn't really help with stability. So, if you've ever wondered why this half of America has so many Spanish names, now you know better. Sharing the blame for Mexico's instability though would be an early charismatic leader named Lopez de Santa Anna, serving as president a whopping 12 times as an autocrat, deeply unpopular for losing the war and ceding so much land to America. He was exiled in 1855. The same year, a radical new set of changes called the Liberal Reform came into place, which as you might guess with a name like that ruffled more than a few conservative feathers, which began the Reform War. Only with the help of the United States were the Liberals under Benito Juarez able to push the Conservatives back. I really wish I had more time to talk about this era, but the main thing to take away here is that the Conservative elites continue to be a problem in Mexico, quietly mm -hmm. waiting for an opportunity to strike and come back to power. And that opportunity, rather confusingly again, was French. Turns out that wars are pretty expensive and Mexico was beginning to rack up something of a significant debt especially with France. France also saw a really good opportunity to work with the conservative monarchists to bring back the Mexican Empire, so as to counteract the influence of the growing United States. Fair enough, really. And so began the second French intervention in Mexico, because believe it or not, they'd actually briefly done this before, back in 1938 during the Pastry War. Good name, by the way. There's nothing quite like a foreign enemy to rally the country together. After briefly declaring the Second Mexican Empire, the French were soon driven out. One of the most famous legacies of the war was the Battle of Puebla, where on the 5th of May, or Cinco de Mayo, the numerically inferior and outgunned Mexican army defeated the French, providing a huge morale boost to the nation. Especially for the liberals who had defended the country, rather than the conservatives who had supported the French. Wow. But before anyone really had time to bask in this great victory, a general named Porfirio Diaz led a coup against the president in 1876, mainly because he was against the practice of presidents serving more than one term. Just by the way, he served seven terms himself. <laughs> Porfirio was something of a dictator and established oh, order with an iron fist, running unopposed in a bid to provide some stability for Mexico to encourage foreign investment. And for all intents and purposes, the country did modernize and the economy did start doing really well. If by that you mean that the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, but so what else is new? Unfortunately, Porfirio hadn't really made a plan for a world without Porfirio and after failing to step down as promised in 1910 and jailing his opponent, the country had had enough. Soon, it was revolution. Diaz was voted out in favor of one Francisco Madero, but to a nation in absolute chaos. Madero managed to be unpopular with both the left, who thought he was too conservative, and the right, who thought he was too liberal, leading to his own ousting and assassination during the 10 tragic days. Victoria Huerta, who had led the coup, had taken it too far. The country wanted Madero out of office, but murder they could not stand by. Huerta was himself ousted by the revolutionaries during the First World War. And now, with no president and large bands of armed revolutionaries roaming the countryside, it's not hard to guess what came next. The Mexican Civil War. With 1.5 million lives lost, 1 in 10 of the total population, the devastating war concluded with the constitutionalist faction of Venustanio Carranza being victorious. But stability was not a luxury Mexico would enjoy for long. President after president was assassinated in the 1920s. What the hell? Before Plutarco Calles came to power, enraged by what he believed to be the true root of Mexico's problems. Catholics. Another war would erupt with Mexico's devout. Cristeros, the armies of Christ seeking religious freedom, 
The political party established by these revolutionary presidents, by the way, would remain in power in Mexico until the year 2000. To give you something of an insight into the rampant instability that characterized Mexico's 20th Jeez. century. Mexico today still has its problems, although they have come very far. The situation in Latin American countries provides an interesting insight into understanding the post-colonial world. We tend to think of the decolonization timeline as America got it first, Africa and Asia got it last, and all other countries got it somewhere in between. Where in that timeline it happened really did matter, informing the nations we see today. Lots of major world events happened in this timeline, each with its own influence on the world. Mexico was still struggling with the deeply entrenched political status quo of their Spanish rulers during their independence movement, providing a petri dish for class warfare. Class warfare is only exacerbated in times of intellectual proliferation, such as during the Enlightenment, which, if well armed, will almost always escalate to war. Wars fought not only on the battlefield, but also in people's minds. Conservatives and liberals disagreed on the fundamental way to see the world, who they were, who they are now, and who they want to be. And history, or the romantic idea of history, has arguments to support either side at either time. Conservatives had after all benefited from the land policies of the Spanish, and the liberals had benefited by the intervention of foreign powers. Extra points for fighting the French. Foreign intervention. Where have we heard that story before? If Mexico's history teaches us anything above all else, it's that change is sometimes painfully slow, and what changes do happen don't necessarily benefit everyone. And sometimes if you want that change bad enough, you would overthrow the neighboring city revolt against the foreign overlords, or take out political opponents, whether you stand to benefit or not. The most challenging question I've had to ask myself when writing this video was, in the Western world, when did we stop thinking of stability as a luxury? Because my intuition says Mexico probably never did. The conquistadors have been subjected to centuries of propaganda called the Black Legend, and it is important to understand that the propagators were mostly Spain's rivals, the British. But dismissing these conquistadors' actions as simple exaggeration or myth is equally problematic. I've shared a series called The Butterfly Effect on this channel quite a few times, because it really is just a stunning series. With gorgeous animations and production quality, the episode on Hernán Cortés is a great way to understanding the beginning of the colonial era in Mexico. Hernán Cortés is a very controversial figure, not only in Mexican history, but arguably the world, and it is important for us to understand the less savory period oh, for intellectual yeah. honesty. You can watch this series or any other on Curiosity Stream. Shout out to him getting his money, man. I'm gonna let this go because this was, what, a year ago now, so the ad's probably not, um, not what, like, happening now, but... Shout out to him getting his money. This is a really, really good video, man. Mexico's history is just like, it's one of the most sort of like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. It just, it's such a deep history that there's just so much to look at. I didn't expect it to be anything like this, but I mean, yeah, it makes sense as to why it's the country it is now. It's been through so much to get to the point where it is. So, I mean, that's one thing. Cause I feel like Mexico now is, um, not, not all, because there's still people who aren't, but overly, and it is kind of, I would say it is like one of those countries that you sort of see the people, they just, they love each other. And I don't know, maybe there's a lot of togetherness because of this kind of stuff that the country's been through. But again, maybe I'm speaking on behalf of most people, because I know there's obviously people in every country that aren't the same, but. Mexico, finally, we got stability. Narcos joined the chat. France, we have most revolutions. Mexico, hold my tequila. I'm so happy you made the clarification that Mexicans, Mexicans never called themselves Aztecs. Proud of myself because I speak Aztec, speak Aztec language. Nah, you t I can't say that. Nah, who at all? Like my parents and grandparents. That's pretty cool. We don't know what happened to the Mesoamerican civilizations because the Spaniards burnt all the Aztec libraries. Jesus, man, there's so much history there that we could have been seeing now. Fuck all the colonizers, man. British colonizers, Spanish colonizers, every colonizer, fuck them, because the history that we could have had. And then at the same time, I guess it's one of those things that colonizing sort of, it helped, but it made things a lot worse in the moments when it actually happened. I don't know, I don't, I'm probably not the best person to speak for, to be honest. 
The Mexican Civil War is such a headache to learn. As a Mexican, I don't even try to explain it. And to say violence for many dead presidents. As a Mexican, I approve of this. It's impossible to put every single detail in Mexico's history, but this video is really good. That's what I was saying. Like, there's probably so much more to say, but in like a sort of 25 minute video, I guess he got a lot in. The way you pronounce Zacatecas. The Mayans downfall was because the predator is lost to the aliens. <laughs> I'm Mexican, so I know it's impossible to put all history in one video. And even with that, you are actually better than most of my history teachers. All I want to say is that I love your videos and keep it up, man. I really enjoy your content. Yeah, it was a really good video. I mean, but like I said, let me know some more videos. Maybe some more historical sort of videos to do in Mexico. Or food videos or cultural videos or like sports videos. Whatever you want me to see, suggest it. And I would, I would really want to get into more um, Mexican reactions because you seem to really enjoy them. But... Yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this one. I didn't say too much in this because obviously this is like a new thing to me. I didn't really want to like say something that may offend people because again, I know I'm just getting into learning about Mexico and stuff. But yeah, teach me more. If I said something wrong, let me know in the comments. And I mean, yeah, until next time, like subscribe. Peace.